I'm here with Frank, and Frank's a Rotarian from the Rotary Club of Point Loma, and we're at the San Diego Yacht Club. Yeah. Yahoo! And we're just going to talk a little bit about the theme of uh, peace through service uh, and Rotary and some reflections from Frank on his background and life experience in, in respect of peace. So we'll start with uh, a little bit about your background, Frank. Okay, um, I was, I, I'm living on the West Coast now, but I was actually born uh, on the East Coast in Baltimore, and I was raised in, uh, in Denver, this is, mm -hmm. uh, Colorado, which is where I grew up, which is a, very much a mountainous place. Um, went to university there, um, pre-medicine, which was something I was interested in until I actually worked in it a little bit and found I didn't like, I had, I had trouble dealing with the emotions of people that I cared about dying. It's kind of mm, interesting. Yeah, it's and, not easy. And uh, so I went into oceanography, which uh, uh, opened me up to the draft. Mm. Uh, and so I wound up being, uh, uh, I am getting up in the Navy. Uh, and uh, because I was an oceanographer, that got me into underwater acoustics. And I ended up working um, the Cold War during Vietnam era. Everyone else is in Vietnam uh, fighting, uh, you know, and, uh, and I'm dealing with um, the Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union and their submarines, and so it was. Uh, uh, so I was involved with ASW uh, and underwater acoustics, and it was a, it, it was really very fascinating. Uh, and I had uh, the thing that was uh, of interest to me, and I and um, uh, I guess I'll go on. I, since I've uh, left active service, I just did five years of active service. I went to work for a Navy laboratory out here in San Diego, mm. and I just down here at the end of our Point Loma. So I've been on Point Loma all my life. Uh, all my working life, mostly, and uh, um, and so I had an opportunity to work on a lot of advanced projects and a lot of things which involved surveillance and intelligence and and things which um, I found to be, I mean, ironically, uh, kind of useful to the peace process mm. because they, um, when the more you find out about your opponent, which is what you're working on two things happen. One, you know their capabilities and they know yours if we have, mm. uh, if there's a lot of, uh, uh, of good intelligence going both ways. Uh, and, um, and that's a good thing uh, to, to say, oh, I, we don't want to go to war. We don't have to go to war. Uh, they're not particularly good at this or they are good at that. So, we, you know, I mean, so it, it, has, it has a balancing effect. And the other thing is you also start to see them as Human beings. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, and so I like that part of it. I, you know, you, you, we spent you know time trying to find, you know, trying to understand the um, your opponent, um, and that's you know that's one of the lessons of Sun Tzu and Clausewitz and all the things that we deal with mm -hmm. in the history of warfare. Um, but it also develops a respect for uh, your opponents, um, and I think uh, also encourages you to think about war as a last resort rather than a you know, first result. Because there was that first strike um, paradigm, wasn't there? Well, we, had it, we certainly had it mm. back there. I mean, you know, the, 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 you know when, you, when, you, when you say mutually uh, assured destruction, you mm. say mad. Yeah. Had, it had a lot of meaning. I mean, it, mm. it was an incredibly mad idea. You know? um, a thing that kept me awake many, many nights. You know, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're actually in the process of dealing with and tracking an opponent who has uh, um, submarines, um, which have 16 missiles with three, you know, um, warheads, uh, re, you know, multiply, what do we call the MIRVs, right? Multiply mm. targeted re-entry vehicles on each one of those things, and you realize the entire, all the, you know, Western United States could mm. basically be wiped off by one submarine with that kind of capability. Um, uh, it makes you really think uh, uh, about. The possibility of global annihilation. I mean, it's when you're just kind of working, or you're going to school, or you're not, you're not sitting there looking at it and living with it every moment. Um, the threat is it becomes distant, and uh, when the threat is is immediate and insistent, uh, and you realize the potential cost of not being able to establish uh, uh, a peaceful relationship. Um, it's a it's a very different um, it's a very different experience. It made it, it, it made a great deal of difference in my mind, and it's one of the reasons I chose to come to work at a laboratory and continue working on developing um, tools and systems that that uh, um, that improved uh, uh, our knowledge uh, and improved um, 
our uh, our surveillance capabilities. And I was interesting. I always was, I was always a proponent of what they call open skies, mm -hmm. which was a, a notion where we are never going to really attack our opponent's surveillance because it's important in that sense to. Uh, to be for them to have be able to surveil us as well as we surveil them. So um, enabling both parties to know where each other stands is a form of deterrence. It is. Is it? Yes. It's a form it, uh, deterrence and understanding, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think mm -hmm. and I think they Through go that. hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's deterrence because you say, well, they I mean, you know, gosh, they've got a terrible. They, they certainly have the capacity and the and the threat. But uh, I think an awful lot of wars get started uh, by uh, by hubris and by ignorance. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, um, yes. Uh, you know the the experiences we've had lately, and in, in, you know recently in Afghanistan, and you know and uh, and and in Iraq, I think were uh, were wars of ignorance and hubris. We we were very ignorant of them as a cultural people. Um, but we, what about corporate interests, um, sort of getting somehow embroiled? Um, you know, given that we've got political action committees uh, that can influence government policy. How does that sort of play in, do you think, as a, another factor in escalating possible wars? Well, it does. Uh, I hate to admit it. I, I mean, I, I think it does, in fact, play. Um, because there are, um, it's interesting, they, they, there's a, a, a great book, one of my favorite books, written by a fellow named Lester Thurow, T.H. You've heard of him, yes. You've heard of him, yet? yeah. Sloan Kettering. He wrote a book called Head to Head. And he said, um, now that we, you know, that the Cold War is over in the early 90s. We are, um, we're going to have an economic competition, which while challenging is healthy because it's a, it's a respectful um, way of, of approaching each other's um, uh, lives. And that an economic competition can lift everyone. It can make a, it can make a, a, a difference across the world. And his thought was that military power would be a waning um, source of power to governments and would therefore become ultimately unimportant. I'm oversimplifying. But um, I enjoyed I enjoyed that and it was where I thought we could, uh, could perhaps head. But there, um, Mr. Eisenhower's, uh, our president's uh, warning to us about uh, a military industrial complex uh, and commercial interests which are protected or shared, shall we say, the military industrial complex interests um, are a powerful uh, force, both economically and um, and when a, a military arm uh, can be part of that, uh, it'll be uh, um, it's it's a dangerous uh, combination. It's a threat to peace. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting when you think about things like power, yes. and if we're looking at um, masculinity, even you know the warrior, you know yes. often that's used. Um, in dialogue with, with military people is, is that warrior image. And you wonder whether the combat takes place on the economic playing field. Um, in, in they, they certainly use terminologies that have been taken from military planning as part of their own uh, you know, product or service expansion into the world. So I'm wondering if there is some, something that people are seeking to prove uh, through that power. Um. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, um, the military terminology gets used, uh, interestingly, um, also in athletic. Mm. You see, see athletics mm. and military, you know, winning at all costs. You know, there's um, some of those um, um, kind of ideologies uh, which you have associated with the masculine, and I think, mm. that in fact, that's true. Um, uh, they, they are certainly, I think they're very much part of our DNA, uh, and so, um, but there's, but they, you know, I mean, I, you know, sort of as the old biologist, I think a lot of the, a lot of DNA things get turned on uh, by external factors, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they're not necessarily inherent. They're, they're, or, or they're inherent. They're there, but they aren't necessarily activated, uh, other than except by external pressures and external factors. Uh, uh, epigenetics is the term they use for it. Um, we're getting this. We're getting an area which is probably not even. Very well understood, but I, I, I see people who who uh, who uh, really use a lot of that warrior terminology. They use it a lot. Um, what I find is very few of them actually have ever been warriors. If that makes sense, they, they some of them have been in athletics and these kind of things. But people who have seen war and been directly involved in it, um, 
I don't find them using mm. that terminology. I, uh, it's one of the things that worries me about our own congressional experience is that people who have not served in the military, um, I think, are more reckless and more quick to use it because they're thinking of it in terms of a game. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, and that's why I say the the, the the athletic and the you know the win and all those kinds of things because you know, nobody wins in a war. Mm. And until you've been in one, you don't realize that, you know. Uh, and I think too, our situation on the planet is we've uh, we've got enough warheads to destroy the planet at least four times over, and and it's and certainly from the Russian situation, um, some of the uh, uranium fell into the hands of uh, you know individuals. You know the suitcase. I think they were keeping them in suitcases. Yeah, so the suitcase bomb. Yes, yeah, precisely. Um, and also with uh, a sort of an under awareness of conflict resolution as a possible solution, like people learning how to resolve conflict. Um, what sort of possible future do you think we could create um, that could lead us on a more peaceful path, given your experience um, in the military and even as an oceanographer? Well, I, you know, um, interestingly, the place I, uh, where I've seen some of the greatest cooperation um, is in scientific endeavors. You look at a place like the Antarctic, mm. um, you look at oceanography, um, there is conflict in oceanography when it comes to economic factors. Uh, fishing rights, things like this can be pretty da damaging. But uh, those are, but those aren't usually aren't the scientists that are, that are raising the, the scientists' concern are for um, maintaining uh, a, a population of, uh, of fish that that is sustainable and and and, uh, and exploitable. Uh, yeah, we need to eat, but if we if we destroy all of the uh, um, the, fi the the fish population so they can't recover, as we've done, for example, with the sardine fishery in the west coast of the United States, um, uh, it, it's a, it's another it's a lose lose proposition again. Fishermen are out of a job. Nobody has any fish. So um, I think I think that that. Um, from, from my experience, is if we can get to a point where um, ra rational thinking, and, I, and when I say rational thinking, I'm talking really about scientific method, in a sense, that um, we, we have to get over the fact that we're, we're, we are the finest, we are the best, we are, we are the ones that actually know um, an answer uh, and, and, and use um, science. Um, uh, that's kind of my, my, my view of it, to... to so sort of uh, neutrality in a sense, isn't it? Because well, scientists often have a paradigm they're trying to prove. Correct. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, you, you, what you, when, when you go to science, things have, you, have to, you have to be able to... Um, you have to have hypotheses, and you need multiple working hypotheses, so you, won't mm. get, you don't get attached to a hypothesis which um, becomes um, uh, uh, dogmatic. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't. Science, scientists are human, and that's a, in that sense, they we have scientists that get very attached to their own notion of what's real. But in a, in a scientific community, that will immediately be challenged by by people who don't share the same dogma, and there may be knockdown dragouts. But in that in that magisteria, in that that domain of study, there are sets of rules about how decisions are made, and they're made on a rational basis where, okay, we're gonna propose experiments to dissolve, to, to resolve this, and we'll determine whether these, and here are the hypotheses going in, and then we do the experimentation, and we, just, and, and, and we either support or we uh, um, don't support hypotheses. And you never have an absolute answer. So, so, so it sounds, just sort of interjecting for a second, it sounds yeah. very important that if we were to look at a, a peace issue, like looking at the other side of the, of the military, is really developing a very sound working hypothesis um, to answer a question, and it could be in relationship to is this my enemy, or is this going to further the interests or the goals, is this going to um, expand that to the whole of humanity, you know, how is it going to impact on humanity as a whole, and that's your ocean population if we were to look at the other side there of science, what I, what I, I think you're—I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think when you, and one of the things when you say to develop a hypothesis, one of the things that's important to do is to, is to, is goes back to my comment. It, it was ha um, one of the most interesting classes I ever took. Dealt with the method of multiple working hypotheses. Mm -hmm. You need to have a whole series of hypotheses about why things might happen, so that you don't go yeah. in saying. Hmm, I really am very fond of this hypothesis, or I go in with just one, because I have you have a tendency then to ignore contravening evidence, 
And what you and, and so what you want to do is you want to have uh, you want to make sure that you are completely neutral about how the evidence is collected and how the data is analyzed and how that applies to the various hypotheses. And so if you go in with multiple working hypotheses, then you don't become overly fond of one. Yes, you don't yeah. champion an idea and it, or create a blind spot because exactly. you're focused. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and, and, and I, apply, I believe that this applies, uh, can apply as well to, um, uh, to war or non-war. I mean, I, you know, the way, as they say, non-war is not peace, right? I mean, that, and that's, I think, one of the, it's one of the very important things about the, the, um, the peace initiatives that Rotary is coming up with, is putting some definition on that. Because there are a lot of people saying, so, well, if we're not at war, we're at peace. Well, you know, no. Uh, you know, I mean, peace is, uh, has a lot more deeper meaning uh, than that, certainly to me. Uh, but what does it mean to you? Well, uh, you know, um, I think that, that's why peace through service is important. To me, um, uh, peace is, is not just the absence of war. It is, abs it is actually um, groups of people uh, working together for the betterment of, um, of humanity, uh, of the environment, Many times, even in a low, in a very localized sense, of uh, trying to, um, I just think of things like trying to, um, to, uh, to, to recover um, a, a rather small. Point Loma, for example, we have a, 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 a what things called a Famosa Slough, and it was a, it was a, just a dumping ground. It was a place where people threw their trash. Um, uh, it was, it was horrible. Um, getting together and working together, um, cleaning that up. All of a sudden, you have an area where fish come and breed again, uh, you have uh, um, uh, birds that have returned, um, and you have, uh, you actually have a living um, ecosystem, um, which um, would not have happened if people of goodwill hadn't gotten together, and, and um, but it was a battle, right, okay, so that's why it was at peace. Uh, it, it wasn't a war, but there, but there was a big struggle, nobody wanted to spend, you know, the politicians didn't want to spend the money doing it, and uh, uh, some people said, "No, we don't. You know, I mean, that's a waste of time." And and so there's and there was a there was a conflict, and and so you know, yeah, war is a form of conflict, but there's a lot of other conflict too. But but by getting people together and 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 ha and doing a scientific analysis of the, I mean, I, I keep coming back to that of mm. the of the of the um, water um, the, the slough actually. Uh, people say, yeah, you know, if we if we open this up and we allow tidal flushing to happen. Um, this can be improved. We can get this out. We got to get the trash out of there, um, and and um, pretty soon um, the conflict went away. And and you know, just sort of throwing in the, the thought about conflict resolution, uh, often it's working out the needs and concerns of others when you're seeking to resolve a conflict. So you have to be able to sit and listen to the other side, and also be able to express your side. And it's it's very interesting what you're saying about bringing in the scientific idea because that's the neutral third party that's assessing um, what is the best way to move forward and in conflict resolution it's not dissimilar you know mm -hmm. both parties have to work out options and solutions to come out with um, a, a clearer outcome and, and I guess to just sort of get this down to the kernel of what we're talking about here is problem solving yes. it, predominantly whether you're coming from science or conflict resolution or just generating different uh, hypotheses uh, or paradigms. We're really si learning to sit down together with different viewpoints and work out clear hypotheses uh, so that we can develop a, a better outcome for all. I think that's exactly right. It, there, there, it's not just a hypothesis either. It, 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 is, it is the way of, uh, of thinking through problems. I mean, you're absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Uh, problem solving um, requires uh, a clarity of thinking and uh, and, a, and a, a set of rules for how you make decisions in the domain that you're working in. And um, religion, for example, is a domain. Um, it does, it is, um, um, the, you know, Stephen Jay Gould uses uh, um, um, the Catholic definition of magisteria, right? We have different magisteria, and we have all this, keep talking about, you speak about this conflict between religion and science. and. I don't believe that there is a conflict. Uh, they are, you know, what Stephen Jay Gould would say is that they are different magisteria. They have their own domains of study. They answer different sets of questions. Mm. So, you know, so if science, uh, and this is why I think it needs to come in. Science comes in and, and it tries to ask, ask the questions in an objective way 
that says, okay, um, we, 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 we establish, uh, we do observation, we establish hypotheses, we test uh, and those hypotheses through a series of experiments, and we revisit, okay? And so there is a way of resolving conflict in there which involves uh, an objective uh, method of, of making decisions. In other magisteria, religion can be one too, there are also rules. For, uh, for for making that work and, 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 and for dis and for resolving disputes um, we may not agree with them but they're there right uh, you know and mm -hmm. the difficulty I ha you, you have is, is if you have someone who who takes the rule uh, doesn't doesn't respect the rules of the magisteria that they're out, that they're dealing in right so so you have scientists making statements, about the validity or the utility of a religion, or you have religion making statements about the validity or the conclusions of science, and what you wind up with in one case is bad science, and the other is bad religion. Right? I mean, there's mm. so you have to, uh, um, and so that I really think that as you start realizing how these domains of thought interact, uh, we can um, we 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 uh, we can then start. Um, Resolving those mm -hmm. kinds of conflicts, uh, and, uh, and 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 it really actually begins to work. You can yeah, and, you know. and it sounds like transcending uh, the two conflicts, being having the capacity to be able to overview two different perspectives without taking a position on either side, um, and and having respect for diversity, you know. Respect, respect mm. for diversity, and and that diversity being the fact that there are there are, there are other sets of rules for how decisions are made, mm. and, uh, and it, it is um, yeah I, I, I like that yeah. it, it is a diversity yeah. it's a, it is a respect for diversity of opinions and uh, without without um, without condemnation. And that's the essence of democracy, is it not? When it's truly applied. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it is. Um, yeah, it, it, a, a respectful dialogue and a respect for your um, for, for the loyal opposition is is, is the critical piece. That it, it's the one of the reasons I think we're having as much trouble in the uh, in the world is that we. I mean, I say in the world, but in the in the in the rising democracies, there's there's a sense that if we go in and we say, okay, we uh, we're going to, uh, I mean. Our country, U.S., my view, um, guilty of hubris and going in and saying, "Okay, we're going to create a democracy. Everyone's going to vote, uh, and, and we'll have it. And once you have an election, then you have a democracy." Well, you don't. I mean, democracy involves all the things that we've just been discussing, which is having, you know, ways of resolving conflict, uh, respect for the minorities, respect for uh, the opinions of others, um, um, dialogue, protecting minorities, um, uh, appreciating. Uh, diversity, and uh, if if all you have is a, is a vote, and then uh, uh, the, the, all you wind up with is what's been called the, the, the you know the tyranny of the majority, right? Mm -hmm. the, the majority vote wins. Hey, we win. All the rest of you lose, and so you have to do what we say, and um, and even to the point of killing them if you mm -hmm. don't do what we mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and I think that and again that that takes that kind of cycles us back to how I think we get into these wars. Um, uh, and whether you want, you know, whether they're big, small, or indifferent, um, it's you know somehow I have uh, uh, I have I have if if I presume that I have the certain knowledge of truth uh, and, and everyone else is therefore wrong, it's easy to begin to dehumanize my opponent and dehumanize uh, people who don't even think like me, and uh, and that, and then that leads to um, the genocide and Holocaust and, and things much shorter that, than that. That's, that's right, and and that builds on what you and I were talking about outside, yeah. which was, you know, people expect people to think like them, and yeah. anyone that doesn't think like them becomes that enemy. Uh, what I particularly love about Rotary is the four-way test. Yes, I've considered that to be an excellent form of conflict resolution. You might want to just repeat it here, just for the sake of of others. Okay. Well, and the, <laughs> the, the, first, the first and most important is that you know, is it the truth? Yeah. You know, is it? Uh, Hence your scientific method. Right. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you know, uh, you, you, let's you know, work I mean, it out. Truth, truth can be difficult, and and, and uh, there's we have, you have to do thinking about this. But is it the truth? Is it fair? Uh, to all concerned, uh, will it build goodwill and uh, better friendships? And um, benefit others, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, well, it, it's, um, well, what have I lost? I've missed something in there. No, that, that sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I just, I'm going to give you the three-way test, uh, which is, to, hang on just a minute, just this terrible thing.